My imagination didn't create music. At the end of the year, I thought, you know, what was I thinking? Just because I was like the second best at drawing at my little high school, that, that meant I should be an artist. Maybe I shouldn't have decided when I was 11 years old that I was going to be an artist. I took a leave of absence. I didn't just like quit. The phone rang at like 11 o'clock at night. There was this really soft voice on the other end of the line. It sounded like someone disguising their voice. They said, you know, this is so-and-so, and I'm curator at the Museum of Modern Art, and we've acquired one of your works, and we we're calling to see you. Conversing with Tutsinski taught me to focus on what my imagination creates, to make what I want to make, and to not be afraid to try something or ask. Mary Ann Tutsinski is a widely acclaimed American artist who invented filet de verre, a highly laborious technique for creating beautiful vessels composed of thousands of thin fiber optic sized glass threads. Her works are extraordinary in color and texture and interweave the traditions of painting, sculpture, and the decorative arts. At 11 years old, she decided to be an artist, almost gave up on her dream during her freshman year at Rhode Island School of Design, and now she is recognized in over 100 international museum collections, including the Museum of Modern Art and the Met in New York City, the Musée des Arts Décoratifs du Louvre in Paris, France, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art at the Renwick Gallery, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and the Hokkaido Museum of Art in Japan. Her works are also part of the White House Collection of American Craft. As a lover of all things glass, I find Tutsu's artwork truly stunning. Especially in person. And I am sure that she will continue to put smiles and expressions of awe on the faces of art lovers for many years to come. By sharing and subscribing to this show, you support our mission to encapsulate the meaningful stories and insights of the most innovative people in the world into a library for future generations of exceptional leaders to build upon during their aspiration to accomplish extraordinary goals. Thank you so much for your support. Now here's our conversation with the pioneer of Filet de Verre, Tutsinski. This episode benefits the Wild Y Foundation, committed to building schools all over the world that provide a reimagined educational experience. Learn more at wildwide.com. So what these, this is based on two birds, right? It's based on um, two different Gouldian finches of which there are many iterations of color. Um, I started working on a series of um, endangered species of birds about four years ago. I had been home um, to walk the, my family's property, and which is surrounded by marshland. It's a woodland surrounded by marshland, so there were always just an amazing amount of different kinds of birds there, and so many that Audubon used to bring bird watching groups to our property several times a year because there were waterfowl, there were you know woodland birds that there were birds that you know came every year to our pond like wood ducks they were amazing and Baltimore Orioles that came every year to our elm tree oh. and yeah beautiful and red winged blackbirds that have a really pretty song um, because the marshland had cat nine tails. And um, so I, I, I went for a long walk on the property. It was a beautiful late spring day, I think. And all of a sudden I realized I hadn't heard a bird. And I thought, how strange. What's wrong here, you know? And then I thought, oh, I'm probably making too much noise. I've become such a city slicker. <laughs> so I sat down for a while and just waited and was really quiet and still nothing. And I walked all the way to the, you know, up the peninsula in the middle of, that extends out into the marshland and, and, and still nothing, nothing out in the marshland. And I thought, this is really something, what's wrong here? So when I went home to Providence that evening, I started Googling, you know, all the different birds that I had known, the first being the Baltimore Hill, and, and, and found out that most of them were on endangered or threatened, at, at least in that area. Um, and I, it was, it was stunning. So I started making, I think the first one I made was a Baltimore Oriole. Oh. Yeah. 
that was my favorite bird because um, I remember in the hurricane of, was it 54? There was a terrific hurricane. Then there were two more in 57 back to back. And I remember watching the, the nest of the Baltimore Oriole just being whipped around in the wind. And, you know, trees were crashing. The whole section of my parents' property, the, the trees just kept crashing like matchsticks, which is great because then we get a ball field to play in as a result. But <laughs> after that terrific storm, um, the Baltimore Orioles' nest was still there. And I thought, wow, that's more than amazing. You know, here are these big, powerful trees that were just toppling like matchsticks in this beautiful little nest that was, you know, all woven together out of grass, hanging from a flexible branch of the elm tree, whipping around in these, I don't know, it was one of the strongest hurricanes that ever hit the East Coast. And there it still was afterwards. And plus they're beautiful and they have a beautiful song and they lived right above my bedroom window. So I, I think the first maybe the first one of the endangered species that I made was of Baltimore Oriole. And then I just started researching. You know, at first I... The list goes on and on and on. Yeah, I I started researching, it was actually in 2018, I think, in early 2018. And and I I did a whole show. But then I started researching beyond the region, you know, when you type in endangered species of birds, suddenly <laughs> you get the whole world, you know. And it was later that year, I think I did the show in the spring, and later that year um, they came out with that incredible study, that 50-year study that we had lost in North America alone 3 billion birds in 50 years. I mean, that's just... <laughs> a mind-boggling amount that is is really almost impossible to envision. Right, you can't. But you know it's a lot. <laughs> and a lot. I mean, if they had said three million, that would have been a right, lot. Right, right. But three it was billion. three billion. That's in North America alone. That doesn't count the rest of the world. I mean, when are we going to wake up? At this point in the conversation, I took a moment to read Toots' accomplishments from the intro that you saw earlier to our live audience at the time. The conversation picks up here. So tell me what you feel. That was a lovely surprise. Tell me what you feel when you hear that. Um, I'm, I'm still surprised. It was a lovely surprise. Did you envision that that would be on your uh, introductory list when you first started never. out? I never. I never imagined that I would be at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, you know. I, I get a phone call one night, not long after we'd returned from Africa, and people were calling us at all different hours from all over, you know, friends from all over the world, because they knew we'd been gone a long time, and we were unreachable. So they were calling to see if we were home yet, or they'd heard we were home, and and one night, um, the phone rang at like 11 o'clock at night, and there was this really soft voice on the other end of the line, it sounded like someone disguising their voice. <laughs> and they said, you know, this is so-and-so, and I'm, um, I'm from the Museum of, I'm a curator at the Museum of Modern Art, and we've acquired one of your works, and we'd, we're calling to see if you'd be willing. We'd like to commission another piece. Oh, sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I just said I, I can't really repeat what I said because I thought it was a friend, <laughs> but I kind of said, "Oh, cut it out! Come on, who is this really?" Um, but I used a four-letter word too, and um, and the same soft voice said, "This really is so and so, and I really am from the Museum of Modern Art, and we really do own a piece of your work, and we really would like to commission another one," and I was like. Oh my God, what an idiot I am, you know. <laughs> I just, you know, it's like, can I go out and come in again, please? <laughs> um, and that started like a wonderful, I, I think it was a wonderful new um, idea I had about the possibilities ahead of me for my work. 
I mean, I never imagined that. And this was like the first museum that acquired my work. Ever. Or, or the oh, second. wow. Yeah. I mean, the first one was Corning Museum, but they collect glass all the time. But MoMA was just like way up here for me. And I'd never even thought about it. So it was like, it, it was a real revelation to me to think about my work in, in another way and that there were endless possibilities that I'd never really considered and that I could consider them, you know, and and start, like, just shooting for the stars, you know? What What is the source of your art? <laughs> I don't know. Everything. That's the real answer, too. It's everything. And did you always want to be an artist? Did you, was glass always your medium? But wait a minute. I have to ask you. Where does Toots come from? Oh. My brother. My brother. <laughs> my brother was three years old when I was born, and when I came home, that's what he called me, and that's the name that stuck. It stuck. So it's not actually on my birth certificate, but my parents added it to my legal name because it's all they ever called me. It's all anyone ever called me, except a few teachers in school because my full name, I'm named after, the reason I haven't dropped the rest of my name is because I'm named after two of my grandmothers who oh. I loved a lot. And um, so I've never wanted to drop that. It just felt like I would be abandoning them or something. So what's the full name? Um, Mary Ann Toots Zinsky. Beautiful. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> no, I, I love long, beautiful names. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Um, so uh, I'm trying to get in your head a little bit for the inspiration. Your, I mean, I just smile when I look at your artwork. It well, makes that's me, nice. It makes me so happy. And that's nice to hear. We were looking at pictures and we were just saying, oh my God, this is so beautiful. Oh my God, this is so beautiful. Is that part of the piece in your head to elicit that kind of reaction? Um, I, I, you know, I don't sort of consciously think about that. I, I make what I want to make, you know? And um, actually the first thing I wanted to be was a dancer. Huh. And there was just no place to, I come from a small New England town, there was no place to study dance. So I would, you know, I would, I didn't really spend much time watching television unless I was sick or something. I didn't like sitting still that long. Um, but I would go through like WGBH or whatever it was called then to, you know, to see Jacques Cousteau specials Jacques and Cousteau. anything about dance. And I would watch the dance and I would go outside and practice and practice and practice till I got like the the leap that they had done or the spin or whatever. And I was terrified of the dark when I was a kid, but I would go out in the dark in the backyard and have my mother turn the back light on and watch me so that I could keep practicing after dark. But um, so then I did sports because there was no dance. So I would do every sport that meant I could run or jump um, or leap. So, you know, I, I was the center forward on the basketball team because I loved <laughs> to jump. And, you know, I did broad jump, high jump and hurdles. I mean, anything that meant jumping, you know, I loved um, and moving. Have you ever thought about why you like to jump so much? I don't know, maybe I was a bird or an animal in another life or something. Do you feel free when you're jumping or in the air? Oh, always. Yes. Always. Fantastic. And I also loved music. Um, so I started playing piano when I was three years old. And I and I played very seriously till I was 14, but I realized that. And I always loved art. But that was kind of third. Wow. Because um, it meant sitting still. Because it what? It meant sitting still. Ah. And and that wasn't something I was good at. Um, but by the time I was 14, I realized that um, I loved music, but I wasn't... 
My imagination didn't create music. Wow. And, you know, maybe at the time if I had, had I had a wonderful piano teacher, um, and maybe if he had sort of kind of told me that there was an enormous creativity in in interpreting someone else's music. That could have changed my life then, but it I I would try and compose music. I just couldn't, you know. I, Did you ever think about being a conductor and all that me- no. movement? No. So you said art was third. Hour. No, but you know, I I spent a lot of time, you know, st- still doing, you know, drawing and learning how to paint and just making things. I mean, I was making things. Um, and so I decided when I was about 11. I knew by the time I was 11 that I wasn't a composer of music. And I, you know, we did art in school, and I always did well, and I enjoyed it and was encouraged about it. And so I decided, well, that that's where I'm going. Looking back, do you well, feel I, any, any, any regret choosing the third thing on your list as your... No. No, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I love dance. My granddaughter at two declared that she was a dancer and she's, she dances, you know, for hours every week. Um, and she's 14 already. So my son called me up one day and said, mom, you're going to love this. And I said, what? And he said, well, Zoe just declared that she's a dancer. Not, I want to learn how to dance. I'm a dancer and I need to take lessons so I can learn how to dance better. Wow. Yeah. Be very clear about it. Um, no, I don't regret it. I've had a wonderful life, you know? I mean, um, I've been very involved with dance. I, you know, I love it. I love to go watch it. I love cla- everything from, you know, <laughs> tribal to classical to contemporary, everything. Um, well, I think your art dances. Oh, well, oh, that's thank you. That's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, that's true. I was on the board of um, what's now um, Ballet Rhode Island. It was Festival Ballet for a long time, for 20 years. Um, I was on the board and then chairman of the board finally there. Um, I, I love dance. I think it's one of the toughest art forms. And even it, difficult to appreciate for a lot of people. Yeah, that too. Um but it's, it's, as far as the person that's doing it, it's the toughest art art form. I mean, it's just brutal on your body. You're, I mean, they're in pain a lot, um, and they keep having to rehearse. I remember living in Vermont, and a f- neighbor's, um, you know, friend came up from New York City. She was New York City Ballet, and or ABT maybe, and and every day she was out there dancing on the lawn you know, and doing exercise. And I said, wow, you never get to take vacation. She said, I'll injure myself if I don't, you know, stay in shape. So, and I, you know, I watch the dance. I watch the injuries they get, and sometimes it's career stopping. Oh. I mean, I've seen been tons of two movies or three about of my favorite dancers in the company, really fine dancers. I, I watch one of them land on stage and then, we all knew something was wrong because we knew what the choreography was. And she very gracefully got herself off the stage. She had torn some major thing, and that was it. That was it. Her career was gone. She was only like 21. Wow. <laughs> and she'd been dancing since she was really young. I mean, that's what happens. It can just, in a moment, boom. Um, so it's a, it's a tough Did career. Did you define did she define herself by her dancing? Well, I mean, it's it an tough? essential part of who you are. It's not even a choice at, an, at, at a point. You know, it's just who you are and what you do and what you have to do. You wake up every day and that's what you have to do. Um, do you love what you do? Yeah. I wouldn't do it if I didn't. Right. I mean, it's not fun. <laughs> no. So. Yeah, why don't tell us the process? Tell us the process. Tell us, so fun. How did this? I mean, but to get back to the connection between dance and why I chose glass, hmm. because I 
really after the end of my freshman year, which was a basic foundation year, it's changed a lot now. RISD has definitely evolved, but it was more of an isolated program, um, unique unto itself in the school back in the days when I was there as a freshman. And at the end of the year, you had to choose a major, but it's like, what? How do we choose a major? So I, I, um, and I, I really suddenly wasn't sure. I mean, we had, we were in school with, you know, as freshmen with these kids who had come from art, four years of art and design in New York. You know, they were, um, we had like an hour or two of art class in high school, and you had to fight to get that. So here are these kids who had had four years of art and design high school, and they looked like artists. They knew artists that we had never heard of. They were seemed to be light years ahead of us with their work. They understood the assignments when you know the rest of us were going. Do you understand the assignment we were just given? You know, and you'd have to really sort of think and think and think about it. And finally, if you were lucky, your subconscious would understand what the assignment was, so you could do it. But by the end of the year, I thought, you know, what was I thinking? You know, just because I was like the second best at drawing at my little high school, that that meant I should be an artist. Um, and so I thought, you know, I think I need a time out here and and really maybe rethink this whole thing. You know, maybe I shouldn't have decided when I was 11 years old that I was going to be an artist. And I remember that I was 11 because I was in fifth grade and I was standing in the hallway with three friends making some, you know, panorama for this, you know, the school had a showcase. And these teachers came up and said, oh, you know, blah, 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 what do you want to be? when you grow up and you know everyone else is like oh I want to be a doctor so I can help people or I want to be a nurse so I can help people I want to be a teacher so I can help people and they looked at me and I said I'm an artist and I'm going to Rhode Island School of Design in fifth grade yeah and they just sort of wow like, who are you um but yeah I was very clear about it or thought I was well you, you know? did it and I did it I I got the book and I um and I you know, found out what I needed to do to qualify to get in, and that's what I, that's what I aimed for. How did you end up developing this as your unique style of glasswork? Well, I started out at the end of my freshman year. They were just creating a small glass studio on campus. They'd had a small one out in a farm, one of the ceramic professors' farms. Um, but suddenly, you know, I made a tour of the whole campus to see what I was withdrawing from. I took a leave of absence. I didn't just, like, quit. Um, I just thought I needed more time to think about it. Got it. And, and actually started looking at pre-med programs. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, but just as I was leaving, I made a tour of the whole school. And... Um, and the last thing I came to, I was just looking on the map. I got the map from Buildings and Ground of every building that RISD owned. And I went to every building. And um, the last, it was the end of the day, the last, I was on the top floor of one of the main buildings, the studio buildings there. And I was just looking for the stairway. And it was at the opposite end of the hallway from where I had come in. And I was up on the fourth floor. So I wanted to get out and down. And there was a double doorway, and I opened, as I opened the, those double doors, there was just this roar and this loud music playing, and there were people sort of dashing in and out suddenly. And I'm like, what's going on here? And I looked in, and they were all in wild drag. And this is 1970. You know, drag wasn't like, accepted or just common like it is now they were in wild drag what is drag Come when, on. when um, men dress up in as, ladies clothes yeah. okay yeah and i mean they go i live under a rock they were actually in outrageous drag <laughs> um <laughs> and <laughs> I got it. And so all the other studios were finishing up for the year, and every, everyone was, like, busily finishing projects and sitting down and quiet, and everything was, like, intensely quiet. And I'm like, oh. 
you know, not this, not this, and not this. And then I came to that, and they were, I looked in, and they were like swinging around hot glass through the air, these tubes of hot molten glass, you know, and they weren't crashing into each other. And there was this wild music playing, and it just looked like this phenomenal choreography going on, this spontaneous choreography. And it just looked like amazing fun, too. Um, and so I watched for quite a while, and then I, you know, had somewhere else to go, so I went. And the next day, I, I ran into one of the guys on the street that had been participant. And, um, you know, we were the only two people on the street, and walking towards each other. And he stopped and he said, oh, wasn't that you I saw looking in yesterday? I said, yeah, it looked really interesting. And he said, well, come on down and try it if you want. We're, we're trying to get students for next year. And I didn't tell him, well, I've already withdrawn from school. I just wanted to try it. So I did. And it was just fascinating. You know, it was just so alive. And I knew that there was probably something I really wanted to do with it. I was totally intrigued, but I did stay out. I stayed out till the spring semester of the following year and and did look at pre-med programs, and it just kept bugging me, you know, that I had worked so hard to get into RISD, and there was this one thing that maybe I wanted to do. So I, I thought, well, I'll go back and um, I'll give it a real try. I'll put everything into being there for one semester and seeing if there's something to really, like, hold on to with it, or if it's just infatu an infatuation, because it is incre incredibly infatuating to watch, you know, hot glass being manipulated. And so I just hawked the Magical, studio. Magical, actually. And every, yeah, and every time someone didn't show up for their blowing time, I took that time, too. And I'd come really early. I'd get up and, and you know, um, watch the professor and his assistant. They they started working at four in the morning, so I'd get up and be there at four in the morning and watch. Why? What's the point of so early? Because that was their blowing slot. Because it was quiet and the oh. glass is fresh. They got the best fresh glass, oh. and it was before the student scheduling started at eight o'clock. So I would get up and and watch them blow, and I learned so much from it because they were both very different how they worked. One was like zen glass blowing, and the other was just wild energy glass blowing. So it was an interesting combination to understand how they both were able to do what they did in such different ways with the same material. And did the zen guy use music also? There was usually music in the glass studio, yeah. Um, and sometimes not. It just depended. Um but by the end of the semester, I was pretty well hooked. And and then, you know, uh, the professor ha had a plan to go out and build a, you know, a summer school on the West Coast for glass blowing, kind of like Haystack School up in Maine, but just purely pretty much for glass, but, but also other media. And, and so he asked some of us to go out with them. And I had other things to do. I, I had some really good propositions that summer, actually. And um, and I was <laughs> full on to do one of those. And and I didn't realize that no one really ever said no to him. And so he was intrigued that I was like, no, I've I, I've got you know I've got really <laughs> great plans for the summer. I said, you've I'm got, intrigued. What were the plans? You've got, <laughs> you've got. You know, every you know, you've got plenty of people. Everyone's like, "Please choose me, please choose me." You know, but I was, I was working so hard because I'd given myself one semester, to it. That was like do or die. If by the end of the semester, I haven't been able to get a handle on this, or I've decided that it's just infatuation, but there's not really anything more I want to do with it, um, then I am leaving, <laughs> and I am going to pre med school. Um, so I was just, but but he, he liked hard workers, and he also needed them to build a school. So he set three older, really good-looking guys after me <laughs> to convince me to come out there. 
And I did. I wound up doing that. And, and, and it was great. It was my first four of us drove cross country in a van with some of the essential equipment that we needed. And, and it was just a fantastic trip. Did you stop along the way? Oh, yeah. We, we, we plotted our trip carefully because we had one week. And it was the week before the national parks opened. Oh. So, which meant you could camp anywhere you wanted in those days. So we we knew that what we were going to do is drive around, around the clock until take turns, the four of us, two sleeping and one navigating, one driving, um, until we got to the Rocky Mountains. And then we would start stopping overnight, you know. So... <laughs> That's what we did, and it was a phenomenal trip, just unbelievable trip. And then we built the school, and it rained most of the time. It's north. You of built the Seattle. school by by hand, or, or how how else would you do it? <laughs> with cranes and <laughs> totally. concrete, and we started with shovels in the pasture. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> in the rain, and we did it. And you have no idea what the rainy season is out there. It is torrential. They wish it still were that way. Because I know. It's it. Being, I was there last fall, and all we the whole time all we smelled was smoke from the big forest fires burning. It was pretty scary. Oh. Yeah, I thought, do I really want to be here? Yeah, no, but it, they had intense rain in those years, and um, finally, after six weeks, it stopped, and the sun came out, and it's just so gloriously beautiful. We were up in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, and when the sun came out, we could see Mount Rainier to the south, 100 miles to the south. I mean, that mountain is so huge and so beautiful. Wow. It still amazes me every time I go there how big it is. Is the school still standing? Yeah, just in 2021 celebrated its 50th anniversary. Wow. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. And it's expanded, and yeah. We did a good job. Yeah, right. If it's still there, it's mm-hmm. you must have done a good job. Yeah. It, I mean, it was a good idea. And, you know, when something's really a good idea, a lot of people are attracted and lean into it and, and you know, feed it more energy so it keeps going. I have many questions, but this just popped into my head. Are artists competitive? Um, it depends on the artist. I mean, in in certain ways, maybe yeah, but it's it's more competitive with yourself, I think, to just keep you know evolving. Are there other people that do something similar to this, or are you the only person? No, I developed this technique. So, could you tell us how you developed the technique? Well, I it, it evolved. Um, because along the way, I did every other, I learned every other method of glass forming. Um, and it's a fascinating material because you can, you can do with glass, you can do anything with glass that you can do with any other material. And there's no other material that you can say that about. You can carve it, you can cast it, you can pour it, you can blow it, it sticks to itself. That sounds silly, but it's a really important quality that something can st- stick and adhere to itself. We humans should do that. <laughs> um, so it, it has, you know, it's endlessly fascinating. It also uses, I knew that I didn't want to only blow glass, but it was the only entry into working with material when I started at school. And over the years, the, the program has evolved to enable students to deal with it in any way they, in all the many ways that you can. But when I get out, you know, running a furnace means you have to be pretty permanent in some place. And I've always been pretty nomadic. So that didn't seem like a good option. So even before I left RISD, I had, you know, I would still step in and blow glass just to keep up the skill and and because it's enjoyable. Um, But I had already started doing many other things with it. And um, I didn't want to be confined to 
a blowpipe. Um, and so I started just doing a lot of experiments with like large slumped plate glass and I wanted to make larger sculptures. And, and then I stopped for six years completely and just dealt with other materials, mostly kind of ephemeral materials and, and space and light and movement, you know, air movement and sound. Um, sometimes video, the, the end result was a video. Um, and sometimes it was just um, something in the landscape. I was living up in Vermont. Um, I, and I wasn't documenting it. You know, I was, it felt very free. It felt very free and, and wonderful. And, um, and then one day a friend called up and said, okay, time's up. You need to come back and work with glass. And I went, well, you know. I actually had had an idea, and I kept dancing around it real, and finally realized that I was avoiding the fact or trying to deny the fact that the only thing it, that element of the sculpture could be made of was glass. And I went, okay, I'll come, you know. And that sort of got me going again. I got, I got bitten again. <laughs> I just, yeah. It, I guess once you it's find very seductive material. Yeah. Would and you, sometimes we all hate it, you know. I mean, you know, when you, you can get through a whole project, no matter what, what way you're working with it, what in what manner you're working with it. You can get through a whole project and then do something wrong and, and, you've bro and you break it, you know? Or, you know, someone knocks into it, you know? It's like, aha. Uh -huh. um, so it can also be very frustrating. I, I think everyone that works with glass has a love-hate relationship with it. Mine's mostly a love relationship. And You must have very careful interns and assistants then. Well, some, you know, we've had accidents. Um, what was the biggest one? Any of yours? Was anything of yours destroyed in one oh, of yeah. those? What did that feel like? Like, because <laughs> wait a minute, it takes like nothing to do. You know, there's nothing to do about it when it, something is right. Right, you poured a week smashed, of your life and smashed, and that's it. You know, and you, if you can't get past that, then you can't work with this material. Right. You know, a week of life. It's like you can't go sailing and not expect at some point to go into really cold water you know then you shouldn't be sailing it's 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 what is yeah so the reason i love sailing and i've been sailing for three years is because of the freedom and i know this word keeps coming yeah. up a lot in this conversation because when you're out on the water the rest of the world falls away and if you're in a position uh especially in the boats I sail where you're hanging out over the side mm -hmm. of the boat. You're not yeah. even in it. Right. You're flying. Yeah. You're really flying. So it seems like you've always been searching for freedom. Did you feel oppressed at some point in your I mean, life? No. I just always wanted more freedom. <laughs> Do you know why? Well, I, I ran free as a child. I mean, we had this beautiful woodland that went quite far in but in all directions and looking out over the marshland there were no buildings that we could see it's a pretty extensive marshland now unfortunately they've allowed building where they shouldn't have in the wetlands um but it was it was our eternity you know as far as we could paddle in a canoe um you know to explore the little islands you know that that was all that we could see and we were free when we were there. Our parents were out of, out of hearing range. One of them had a bell, and we thought that was so obnoxious. Um, and you don't have a bell, but however, even with you sitting here, I'll say, when your parents are around, there is a different kind of feeling. We, yeah, I mean, even 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 if they're not and being. It's funny because our parents were, you know, I would say, our parents were fairly protective in many ways, but. When we were in the woods, we were just free. And, and we'd get up at 6 in the morning in the summertime, and we'd meet, meet down in the woods, and we were just, like, wild. I? Wild. And we didn't, no, we were wild. We didn't come home until, you know, sometimes a parent would come down in the woods to get us, 
Or, you know, one parent would start ringing the bell and it's like, do you hear a bell? No, I don't hear a bell. And we know it's really time for all of us to go in for supper. But we didn't care. I mean, our parents were like background material. You know, they they fed us. And, yeah, we knew that we had a warm house because of them. And, you know, and they sort of sometimes it was just a nuisance to have to go home for lunch. You know, we didn't care about eating. We just wanted to keep playing or, you know, climbing trees or you know, digging trenches or all building forts, everything we were doing. That was my biggest thing when I was a kid, hmm? building forts. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. And you don't need parents for that. No. Hmm. Uh, at our beach house, you would leave in the morning and not see them yeah. until dinner time. That was it. Yeah. All day long. And I didn't I didn't feel like, oh my God, I have to see them. It was like, this is this no, really we feels were just good. Fine. We were fine. Which is very different from in the city where oh, yeah. it felt like they were micromanaging you all the time because of school and lessons. Safety. And s- safety. <laughs> Traffic, you know. Yeah. I mean yeah, you can't run in the street and Yeah. Yeah, it's a very different thing. I I, I suddenly wound up being a parent on a mountain from being a parent on a mountainside in the countryside to being a parent in New York City. And I realized I don't really know how to <coughs> do this. This is a whole different paradigm, you know, and I don't get it. <coughs> um and it's part of the it's a lot of the reason when I went to Europe three years later I um, I had a three week ticket. I had gotten permission to take my son, who was seven, out of school for three weeks, and um, the principal was great. He said, "I think it's a wonderful educational experience." Oh, you were fortunate. And we never came back. <laughs> <laughs> I got to Europe, and you know the kids were playing in the street. They were obviously safe. You know that was Amsterdam. Then we went to Italy, and you know kids are just like cherished in Italy and playing in the streets and for the first time I felt my whole being relax because I wasn't tense about my son and you know where was he when do you feel the most free um probably swimming in the ocean or Mm. just being on a beach alone with you know that vast potentiality in front of you um so in contrast when but, you know, I also spent a summer being very ill um, with a strange uh, autoimmune disease post-COVID. And I couldn't read. I couldn't. I had no energy to get out of bed. I couldn't eat. I, I drank water and I ate salt-free saltine crackers because everything else tasted like poison. Um, It took them two months to figure out what was wrong with me. And and it was hot, it was summer, and I, I mean, the days were beautiful. And, you know, the birds were singing and the breeze was going through the house. I opened all the French doors upstairs and and I just lay there in bed, and I'd wake up in the morning and go, oh, what am I going to do today? I feel great, you know? And then I realized I can't do anything. <laughs> I had no energy, like no energy. And I was either asleep or I was just lying there awake. And um, actually, it was like this luxury vacation because I would just lie there and either daydream. And I had been kind of... You know, the couple of years prior to that, going, God, I don't have any time to daydream anymore. I'm so busy all the time, you know. I really miss daydreaming. It's a really important part of creation and of creating. And um, so there I was. I had all the time in the world to daydream. So I thought, well, now you've got what you asked for, so enjoy it. You manifested that. You know? um, and, and sometimes, actually, you know, when you, for days and days... There's nothing you can do. Um, I mean, luckily I wasn't in pain. So I was just like, my mind was just free. Um, 
No guilt? No what? No guilt. Guilt? In the sense that... Why would I feel guilty? Because you weren't doing anything. I couldn't do anything. So right. there was no reason to feel guilty. It wasn't like I had chosen to do nothing and be lazy or, you know, not do something I was supposed to do. I had no choice. So that took away any guilt factor, which was perfect. And um, I, you know, often was in a perfect state that everyone aspires to in meditation, which is a completely empty mind, like not a thought, just empty mind. And it's quite a beautiful state to be in. So it was... um, It wasn't the summer I would have chosen, but it was an exceptional summer that um, I just had time for the first time. It changed my whole sense of time, which is good. Time became circular instead of linear. What does that mean? Well, I think, you know, in the contemporary Western world, time is this linear thing where you're here and you're always heading in towards the line end. towards the f- towards into the future whatever that is and you have a path and you know you're doing something and um you have goals you know um and instead a time became circular again so that it really didn't matter if something happened yesterday or a week before Or tomorrow, it was kind of all in the same circle. It wasn't like you were leaving anything behind because you were always moving forward and leaving things behind. It was just all always there, everything. And and that was, I think, really important to rediscover that because I think that's how children see the world and experience the world Um, and why kids don't miss things. You know, we're sort of always hurrying through time and a line, and we miss a lot in every way, um, both physical and spiritual. And um, so it was, it was, it was a total reset. In fact, so it was, it was actually a great summer. Did your artwork change or take a different form um, after that ex- summer? Did you change? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, probably, you know, it's. I don't really like to use the word change because I think it's more an awareness of yourself. Uh, You know, I, sometimes I did no thinking and sometimes I had time just to just sort of think, you know, kind of, um, stream of consciousness kind of thinking and. And sometimes more like rational thought and thinking about things and, you know, why am I doing this and why have I always been doing it this way and is this what I want to, how, what I want to do going forward? I mean, that's rational thinking, you know? And sometimes it's just totally imaginary, you know, free stream of consciousness kind of thoughts and words and, did you journal anything that summer? No. So you were in the moment and the experience. No, the only thing I journaled that summer, and and I've never done that before. I've never kept a diary. I've never done that. Um, was I started keeping a journal from the very beginning because the beginning was so distinct of this strange illness that I started... And from one night to the next morning, I I could hardly even walk downstairs, you know. And then to get back up, I had to have someone help me. Um, and finally, I mean, I sometimes if the wet, you know, when the, it was a nice day, I would get help to go and sit outside for half an hour just to be outdoors. Um, but. I knew that something was really wrong because it was it was so sudden and so stunning and so dynamic the change that 
I started just, you know, I would get a fever at, you know, I would get a fever that would start usually at sundown and it would last for X amount of hours and it would be this much, you know, and then I would get a strange sort of shimmering headache that just went like, like it could, you could feel that it was just your cranium and just on the surface of it, it would just be like the shimmering hand that would go vroop and then be gone. It was so bizarre. And I thought, these are very weird symptoms. And then, you know, I'd get a rash on, on half of my body. And, and then I, you know, so I started just keeping track of it because no one could figure out what was wrong with me. Um, so by the time I'd gone through lots and lots of tests and, and a lot of um, procedures um, and more tests, and I had this whole journal written down and so by the time um, they were about to put me in the ICU because they said we just need you here around the clock because they never let me know how serious it was but it was really serious and um, they called in this absolutely genius infectious disease specialist so I had this whole journal for him and um, he had also committed to memory in less than two days, morning that he had that he was going to see me. He had committed to memory my entire, all the tests that had been done on me, and it was a good lot. for him. Yeah, he's he's incredible. Th- probably, I mean, he was beyond smart. The guy was genius, and they told me he was a genius. And I've never had a conversation with anybody like him. He was very special. And he put all that together. And all those details that didn't seem to mean anything all added up for him to understanding what I had. Because there's what I had you can't test for, as it turns out. And they were clearly able to solve it. Yeah, with massive doses of steroids. Wow. Did you see anything interesting when you were uh, receiving the steroids? No, I just had this suddenly went from sleeping like 20, 22 hours a day or being just still and in bed for 20 to 22 hours a day to being like having this wild energy and being totally ADHD. Um, <laughs> I started Marie Condoing the whole house. Like, it, I'd, you know, I'd go to sleep at midnight and I'd wake up at two in the morning and going, okay, what's, you know, what am I going to do now? You know, I, I could not sit still. So I just started, you know, literally opening drawers and rearranging them, and you know. Well, at least she ended up with a cleaner and, house for the end yeah. of it, right? <laughs> sort of. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, the whole thing was just this unbelievable experience of, you know, going overnight from being pretty okay, a little bit tired, like what's wrong with me? I'm getting tired, to like being almost yeah. immobile. Yeah. And then, and then two months later. The opposite within hours of giving these massive doses of steroids. So it was just kind of a wild experience. I tapped you because it's already 8.56 somehow. And I've never felt it like people always say they sit here and hours gone by. How's that possible? So I've never felt that before until just now. Sitting uh-huh. here. So it's already been an hour. So but- I did get back to work. I mean, I wanted to get back to work. Um, and it took time. It took time because I couldn't stand. I mean, I stand sometimes 12 to 14 hours a day working on these pieces because once I'm, you know, focused, I don't want to stop. Um, I don't want to lose my train of thought with them. Um, and I could only stand for like an hour, an hour and a half. That's still quite Just a while. standing still doing something. Well, compared to 12 hours, it's <laughs> nothing, you know? So it was a little bit frustrating at first how long it would take to make a piece and, and keep my train of thought with the piece. It took quite a while for that to come back because it took about a year and a half to get off the steroids. Wow. But then it happened, you know? And I just kept thinking, well... If it doesn't happen, I'll have to figure out something else to do with my life. 
there's always something else to do, right? There's a million things to do. You know, I'm, you know, you make a choice and you focus on something, but there's a lot of other things to do. So, always. Always. As we near the end, we always ask our guests this question. If you could give one piece of advice to your great, great, great grandchildren, what would it be? Um, don't hesitate to try something. Don't hesitate to ask. If you never give someone the opportunity to say yes to you, you'll never know if you were going to be able to do that or not. Most people are always afraid to ask, and I'm one of them. You know, we've been doing this show for a year, and every time I ask, it's difficult. I'm afraid. Yeah. I mean, we all are like, what if they say no? Well, it's it's automatically a no if you don't ask. Then it's it's a no. You've created, you've you've made the no by not asking, and not. I mean, what's the worst someone can say to you? No. You know, <laughs> you know, then you go try something else. But if if you don't try, you're never it's never gonna happen, right? So don't be afraid to try. <laughs>